All right, welcome to football today, April 12th, 2024. Um, myself, Bobby Skinner here with Justin Pennant. Chris Rose is not here today. He's at NFL Network Boot Camp. Um, he wanted us to start the show, though, uh, just memorializing the life of O.J. Oh Simpson. Oh, my God. But I told him no. I, I, I told <laughs> I told that corporate, you know, shield, no, we're, we're not doing that. But we're here with Dan Snyder of CBS Sports. Yeah, I think Adam Schefter has us covered for the day as far as that goes. Yeah, Dan Snyder of CBS Sports says, uh, he says, did CBS Sports say that you have to memorialize? Uh, no, anyways, let's. we got Dan Snyder of CBS Sports. We're talking <laughs> quarterbacks of the draft. Uh Dan has done Giants content for a long time and just general NFL content. So without Rose, we always talk with Dan after the draft, kind of recapping the Giants draft class and stuff. But we figured instead of just repeating our quarterback draft preview that we did on our other show, let's just kind of talk through the top quarterbacks with someone who's watched the film on all these guys. So, Dan, appreciate you jumping on with us. Always excited to talk football with both of you guys. And you guys are we love your podcast. I actually just came off Bobby watching two of your breakdowns. I watched JJ McCarthy when it was out last week and I just, I'm not finished actually. I still have like, what is it? Six minutes left of the Drake may one, which I didn't yeah, get the, a chance to finish. I was yeah, hoping to fi- finish 50 this. minutes. And I had to like <laughs> cut some stuff out. Yeah. Um, and I was like, man, there's there's other plays from other games I could pull from yeah. this. But uh, you got it. a lot in there, by the way. It wasn't like you were just wasting time. Like you're getting a shit ton of plays in there. No, I, and that's the way I like to look at film or, or present film um, with these videos is not because you could find, you know, you could find a good play of basically every area of the game with every quarterback and you sit there and talk through why it's such so great. But I want to see like the consistency of you doing this over and over again. Um, but hey, with that, we can. I want to talk about J.J. McCarthy first because he's the more polarizing uh, prospect. We'll talk about Caleb Williams and Drake May and Jaden Daniels. But J.J. McCarthy is the most polarizing because he's not projected to go top three, even though maybe maybe he does. Um, Where are you at with him, like projection-wise in the NFL, independent of where he lands? Yeah, I actually think it's interesting that you mentioned that, Bobby, because he's now, I think, minus 205 to be a top, to be under under five and a half. Like, the odds are heavily juiced on him going under five and a half. So they expect him to be a top five pick at this point, the odds at least. They're trying to get you to bet the other side. So I think he's likely to be that based on that. We'll see if that happens. But as far as what I think, I don't really use those odds to determine how he's going to be as an NFL prospect. I would say this, Bobby, I... It's hard to answer this question from the start. Let's just say I'm not as high on May as maybe I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not as high as McCarthy as maybe some others are, but I can see a path towards success in the NFL level. Now, the question is, is that path towards success something that I would be striving for if I'm building my team? Because if I'm looking to build an all NFL roster at quarterback, I want to find someone who has the chance to be a top five. Maybe I'll stretch that to top six, top seven quarterback in the NFL. Why do I care about that? I don't think you need that to win in the NFL, but I think you need it to win consistently in the NFL because once you give that second contract out, we know it's not going to be like a merit-based contract. You're giving When you get that second contract, for the most part, you're just getting the new most money on the market. Um, there were some exa- exceptions, Baker Mayfield contract, Daniel Jones contract wasn't the top of the market, but it was even those are taking up your your, your number one cap hit on that. Right. Yeah, by far, too, at that point. So you need to be able to win with that cap hit. So that's what I'm looking for. And I have struggles coming to the terms with the possibility that McCarthy could be that. We just spoke with on our podcast on Big Blue Bender. We just spoke with Sean McAvoy, who's a quarterback trainer. And we asked him specifically about my biggest concern with J.J. McCarthy, which is can he ever get a good deep ball. Like is it is, mm. is the fact that he throws the deep ball the way he throws it, just a pure dart out there, right? Not a lot of trajectory, not a lot of touch on that pass. And in addition to that, it's not like timed correctly. It's not like a good dart that hits the receiver in stride. It's a lot of misses on the deep half that you'll see. And then you also see weird things. I believe it was was the Minnesota. I'm trying to look now in my film, but I don't want it to be too bad radio here. But it was either Minnesota, the Minnesota was a weird game. Was it the Minnesota game? There was the Minnesota game where the receiver was running the corner, the deep corner, and McCarthy had a purely clean pocket and he stepped up into the throw. He hitched into it and the ball just hung up there. The receiver makes the catch. So you might remember the play from that. That's one. Minnesota. Yep. It was, a, it was a great catch. It was a great catch. <laughs> the receiver makes the catch, but it's a horrible throw. If you really think about it from an NFL standpoint, because the ball hangs up in the air, it's not led in front of the receiver and the receiver has to slow down to catch it. And like when, when I'm seeing that stuff from a clean pocket, I'm just like, how, how is this 
going to change. And and what Sean said was the quarterback trainer, he's like, this is honestly the type of thing that you need to work on in an off season. Like it's not going to show up in year one. He expects the deep ball to look a lot like as it looks right now. And that concerns me because we just went through years of a quarterback who doesn't use the entire field, in my opinion, in Daniel Jones, and he can do some things well. And it's not like he can't throw a deep ball. Jones's issues aren't trajectory and things like that on the deep half. It's just the willingness to, and, and the fact that does he see it? Does he process it? But regardless of how you get there, Bobby and Justin, if you're not using the entire field, your offense is never going to get to a level it needs to get to, in my mind, at least. So. I have concerns about the ceiling with J.J. McCarthy. I actually think like the floor, if you want to call it that, could be higher than even some of the other prospects who are ranked ahead of him. Like I have major concerns. We'll get to him with Jaden Daniels' profile personally from a red flag standpoint. But with McCarthy, I'm having a tough time coming around, Bobby. I'll say this as far as the Giants go. Do you want me to answer how I would feel if the Giants took him? We, I, I, we'll get into some okay. team fit in a bit because okay. I want to talk about that deep ball sure. and stuff that you're talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and you mentioned with Jaden, like, if if you told me Jade, J.J. McCarthy is a better quarterback than Jaden Daniels, I wouldn't tell you, oh, you're crazy, right? I would tell you the reason you think that is because you think Jaden Daniels just isn't going to be good. And, hey, there might be even some of that in me. Because, I do, like, if you ask me, yes or no, will Jaden Daniels be a good quarterback in the NFL? I would lean no, even though I think because of the upside, he's worth taking that risk. You know, for, you know, if you're the third, if, you know, if Caleb Williams and Drake may go one and two, um, you know, the athletic ability gives you like a high floor and he's created so many explosives with his arm, despite not being the best arm in the world. Like he can throw the deep ball pretty damn well, even though there's some balls that flutter on him um, with McCarthy, where I get my biggest issue is that it's not just some like Drake may has missed deep uh, some misses on some throws is one. It's consistently not a very good throw. And where I think, like, I wouldn't take him is, you know, or wouldn't take him in the top 10 is that when you go and actually, like, watch through his film and you watch what safeties are doing and stuff, and you said you watched that McCarthy video, and I I, I broke this down as my most concerning thing. There's opportunities to make those plays, and he does not pull the trigger. So my thing with McCarthy is, why am I going to bet that, one, you're going to start pulling the trigger on these types of throws. Like he shouldn't have that low of a deep throw rate in that offense that he has. Right. Should he have the volume that the other guys have? No, because Michigan ran the ball a lot. They did it well. That's that's their prerogative. That's not JJ McCarthy's fault. I'm not. And they were up by him. like thirty a lot, which I think is a fair fair you know. Yeah, kind. but it's it's the rate where there's like man, right. you're passing up a lot of stuff. You know, in these play action plays where it's set up to do it, and you're in pockets that you're not going to really get in the NFL very often. Or, you know, that Michigan State game where there's a corner route. He's looking at it. He even, like, kind of pumps into right. it and doesn't pull the trigger because he doesn't have the confidence. So that, one, when the NFL, when things are faster, where safeties are better at playing the two-man game or corners are better at playing the two-man game, corners are just better in general, and protection is going to be worse and everything's moving quicker, that you're going to start pulling the trigger on that. But like you said, are those balls going to get there accurately on time and and give your guys a chance. That's why I just don't think he's worthy of a top 10 pick at, in, in general. Like we can talk about there's other facets of his game, but that's what makes me think no I'm I'm not I'm not going to bet on all this despite all the intangibles. It's really interesting you mentioned that cuz we again we we're just talking to Sean McFlain. He says that that's like really what it comes down to that that some quarterbacks have that willingness to pull the trigger on that throws because they trust their everything about it, the arm talent, their mechanics, everything that goes into timing that you need. And some quarterbacks don't. I would say that McCarthy, I saw a few more of those types of throws on his film than Jaden Daniels, for example, if I'm going to be honest. like To me, Jaden Daniels throwing slot fades and balls over the top. And same thing goes for Penix when they're throwing into all this space and they're using the field side because the hash marks are set up the way they are in, in this massive field side in college football. It's like, to me, I don't really gain much from that personally. I don't take away too much from it. It's nice to watch. It looks good. But like, is that going to be available at any time in the NFL? I don't think so. So I think McCarthy has some of those throws. It's just what you said. It's not, it's not every time. And it's not like that general confidence that you need, which some of these quarterbacks that I've seen in this class, will get to them. I'm sure have, I will say this, if you want some of the strengths I have from McCarthy, cause I'll go through through some of what I wrote up for CBS sports, my scouting report of him. I think yes. some things I like about McCarthy, he has a concise and compact delivery with not a lot of wind up and little wasted movement. I think that's good. I feel like his upper, his footwork and his upper body stay well connected in his past attempts and his base. 
I think he's done. He shows some advanced traits. One that I like is on play action. I think he does a good job of snapping his head around and then ha and getting himself in a position where he's connected and he's ready to throw the football. And he and he's not, you know, you don't see a lot of just like he's wasting all this time and movement on play action passes. I said he's not afraid of some of the tight window throws, but I would agree with you. If, it, if we're looking at it from an NFL projection standpoint, it's maybe not uh, where you want it to be. And then I think he well, shows 10 to 20 ones are good, right? Like that yeah. middle of yes. the field, that anticipation. Oh, you're talking now. about past 20 yards. Gotcha. Yeah, that's where I I, I I don't see is when it's like, okay, you got to do But those middle of the field, that's, I mean, that's his greatest strength is right. the middle of the field, firing those throws with good anticipation. You know, the Ohio State throw that everyone looks yep. at. The Washington, the the throw, my favorite throw is that one versus Washington where it just, I mean, it's a beautiful yeah, flow on, on, the, on that crossing route to Roman Wilson. So he does that really well, which I actually think, like you said, raises his floor. If you can operate True. a quick game in the middle of the field, and especially if he goes to a place like Minnesota, there can be success in the NFL doing that type of stuff. That's the other thing. I think he really is a better fit for the McVay Shanahan tree. It just been given his skill set. And I don't know, you know, I think any good coach will adopt what they're doing for the quarterback, but I just still think the best fits there. I do think he shows excellent poise when he's throwing from under pressure that I like. I'd love to see that with quarterbacks. That was something Daniel Jones showed me at Duke. Um, and I thought that was great. I had, he throws with much better ball placement to the right. I also just feel like this is yes. just a weird, a weird, like, eye test thing that I'm curious to get your guys' take on. I think the ball comes out cleaner when he's throwing to his right. I don't understand why that is the case, but I do feel like the delivery of the football is much cleaner and more concise when it's throwing to his right. Did Listen, you guys if, see that at all? If there's one thing that uh, I, I know we don't fully love PFF grades, but I actually mm -hmm. like P I like PFF grades when it comes to quarterbacks. I think they actually get that kind of right. Um, and I think if you look at the breakdown of where he throws on the field and what his PFF grades are, it's towards the middle of the field. That's really, really good towards the right. That's good. And then it's towards the left side, kind of even in the intermediate range and in the long range. That's, that's not great. That's really not yeah. great. So uh, that, I think that 100% back, backs up what is reality. Yeah. Even and on said, the run, like if he's, if he's scrambling right. to the right and he can even throw him across his body too. But when he's doing that, he can make some really special throws on the run too. That was what I was going to say next. Displays the ability to throw off platform, specifically when he's moving to his right, his throwing shoulder. And to me, he does a better job that he doesn't need to have balanced base, squared shoulders to keep the ball placement, the velocity when he's in those positions. I don't see that a lot for a lot of these quarterbacks in this class. Like, I'm just not seeing Michael Penix do that at any point, um, personally, from what I'm watching. And even right. Jaden Daniels, to me, I don't really know. There may be some examples I can remember, but it's not often. I feel like when he breaks the pocket, he's just looking to run a lot of the time, which we'll see if that works at the NFL level. Um, I think he can change his arm slot and throw from a different a variety of arm slots, which I like better that I have him as better av than advertised athlete, 92nd percentile among quarterbacks with a three cone. And I feel like I saw that when he's, when he's, when I'm watching his tape, there's design runs. I think he has good change of direction. He's not a really burner, but I think he can do that. Um, the concerns I have were the ones you've went over. I mean, there's other stuff I like. He's a tough competitor. I like his hockey background. I, to me, I saw notable improvement from a processing standpoint from 2022 to 2023. I, I used this example when I was talking with Nick, but like I watched the Ohio State 2022 and then Ohio State 2023 back to back. And I felt like I saw a quarterback who was at least more confident in what he was seeing. Um, I thought he did a, I think one area where he struggled to me was identifying blitzes pre snap. I saw some A gap blitzes that were just free rushers. I saw some corner corner blitzes that were just free rushers. Now, I don't love to go too into that, Bobby, and I'm sure you you would speak about speak on this or have some thoughts on this because I don't know what the coaches are actually putting on their plate from that standpoint. I don't know how much of that is the center or the quarterback, but it's still just something I'd like to see. I always bring it back to like Eli Manning. I, I've <laughs> recently I've been watching like Eli Manning Ole Miss games and just the mastery he had and the mastery he had of that Ole Miss offense pre snap is like nothing you'll see from any college quarterback almost ever. And I just would like to see that from someone I think is going to be special at the next level. And that's again what I'm. I'm going for here. So the struggles, uh, the concerns are a lot of what you discuss. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that that you, that we've missed so far on concerns. Throwing to the left, the deep half. Um, I think one concern that's not discussed enough with McCarthy, so we can get into this one, is the frame. The frame, so he shows up the combine at a certain weight, right? But I think everybody who looks at him at the combine can see that he had the bloated face and clearly he had put on weight. I think he's more likely to play in the, maybe if he's lucky, like, two tens range, but I think it's probably a sub two ten, right? And this will get into some of what we did. We're going to discuss with Jaden Daniels, but the players who have had success 
at sub 205 in the NFL and, and maybe he can get there. Like he he's younger. Maybe he can grow into his frame versus a Jaden Daniels who's 24. And I really just looking at his frame. Don't think it's going to happen. The players who have had success at that threshold, and you could always be an outlier, but they're few and far in between. It's like Kirk cousins, three seat, three good seasons, one Jeff Garcia season randomly. And that's it. And then that's, those are just guys who have success. The guys who have even played at the NFL level and started like 12 games or more is like Aaron Brooks cousins, Jeff Garcia and like two other guys. I'll find it later when we discuss Jaden. So then what would be the, what would be like the threshold? Cause I'm, he's, you know, Hey, I'll, and I'll 21 years old. He's young. You could get better at this and that. What's like the threshold that like we're looking at to, to get for the frame. So here's what it, here's yeah. what it is. I have the exact numbers. Uh, and this is a courtesy, by the way, of Nate Tice, who does a great job. He says, it's a short list of quarterbacks who have succeeded in the NFL weighing under 205. And it gets shorter when looking okay. at quarterbacks who have played this century. Since 2000, there have only been five quarterbacks under 205 that have started 14 or more games. And he's not including the statistical threshold here. That me He's just saying straight up start 14 games. So that's Aaron Brooks, Kirk Cousins, Doug Flutie, Jeff Garcia, Bryce Young. And now when he's, when he's getting deeper into the quarterbacks who have started four games and had an average uh, adjusted net yards per attempt of seven or more which he considers a good barometer it's just again the five seasons of cousins and one jeff garcia season so really it's 205 is the number that he's using as a statistical threshold and i'm like maybe he can grow into his frame and he can get to like 210 215 but i don't even know man like if you look at jj mccarthy like and you think about like eli manning played at like 218 220 he was six four and a half like and you look at eli manning you look at that McCarthy's frame. I, I'm not so certain he's going to get into like 215, 220 range. So let me let's let's get to it. Like, what do you think he's going to be in the NFL? Like, let's let's forget. Yeah. Like, hey, let's go into the worst situation or going to yeah. the Vikings, which is like the perfect situation for him. Let's say, let's say the, the Raiders had this crazy trade up and drafted JJ McCarthy. What do you what do you think that he ends up being in the NFL? I, I, my best case scenario come for him was like a little before our time, but we probably remember a little bit of it, like a rich Gannon. If he gets to that amazing level of just efficiency in the middle of the field, in the short area, yeah. the ability to improvise out of structure, make big plays out of structure. Cause there are plays that, that excite me about his like and his tape. I'm trying to think it was the Michigan state game, or I'm looking now to try to find it, but there was a play he made on a broken play where he escaped the pocket to his right. And I think it was yeah, like Michigan a tight end state. who leaked out. Yeah. And he hits him. And now, now we're talking about a 65 yard play that changed the trajectory of the game. And remember 2022, the giants needed plays like that. That was like the difference in wins and losses. A lot of the time, these 17, 13 slog fests and a lot of NFL teams are who don't have elite quarterbacks are going to need to try to win football games like that. And I think he may be able to do that for you. So like best case scenario, I see like a rich Gannon type of quarterback worst case scenario. I, it's always hard for me to do worst case. Cause I have such lower flow, uh, low floors. Like I don't personally believe in a floor at quarterback. People always say like this quarterback's high floor and this quarterback's high ceiling or high floor, low ceiling. I'm like, really, is there even a such thing as a high floor? It's so hard to be good at quarterback. And most like the, there is real like Michael Penick's quote unquote high floor. I don't really buy, buy into that stuff with those types of prospects. So Floor for me would be that he's just not a starting quarterback in the NFL and he fizzles out like we've seen a lot of these quarterbacks who just maybe get a year to start, a year or two to start, and that's it. Well, not even like pro comp though. Like where like Okay. What what what's the conversation around JJ McCarthy year four, do you believe? Okay. Um, but like a best case, worst case type of thing? Just if he went if he went to a team that has some good players, maybe not the best coaching an average, an average coaching. Yeah, I think the conversation might be the conversation that we 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 had at one point with Daniel Jones, like, can you win with this quarterback or do we need to try to fucking find an upgrade at the quarterback position? Yeah. I don't know. I don't see him as somebody who's going to be in the top five conversation after four years. If you're asking that type of thing, top five, top 10. No, but yeah, I, mean, I agree. If he goes to Minnesota, he's going to look. I think he'll look good. Yes. But I, I'm t also tired of being like, this guy's a perfect fit for a Shanahan type offense. You know who well, else is a good fit for that? A lot of people. Lots of quarterbacks because right. it's a great it's a great offense, and then Minnesota's got all that talent. Like, yeah, Fair. you know, there's would Daniel Jones be a lot better fit for you know the 49ers offense than than the you know than the than the Raiders? Yeah, absolutely. But that doesn't make uh you know these guys are good quarterbacks either. It's fair. All right, I want to I want to pivot a little bit because I mean I honestly feel like we could talk about JJ McCarthy for literally an hour. Um, that that's how that's how. Interesting the conversation is, but I, I want to talk about like situation a, a little bit mm -hmm. here. Like, maybe even get some team conversation there because it's so, you know, the, the draft is so messed up and especially evaluating quarterbacks is so messed up that you can have 
like a really good talent. Like we could see yep. a, a Drake May go number two to the commanders. And because Cliff Kingsbury is going to want to just, all right, we're just going to run out routes to the Terry McLaurin, get ready to learn an out route, learn to run an out route, buddy, to the left side of the field. Cause that's what he did with DeAndre Hopkins. And like, all right, we know Drake May can get it there, but it could limit his ceiling, at least for the first two years while, you know, probably Cliff Kingsbury is there. So um, I want to talk about like Cliff Kingsbury and maybe his mix with Drake May and, and Jaden Daniels, uh, plus the situation that is the New England Patriots, because those are, you know, two and two and three um, and particularly those spots for May and Daniels. So, Dan, what are your what are your kind of thoughts of like landing situation with those two teams, those two franchises, those two quarterbacks? Yeah, I would say that, you know, the worst landing spot, if you're asking that, would be New England Patriots, even worse than, you know, the coaches situation. I mean, that's if you if you tell me Drake May goes to the Patriots and J.J. McCarthy goes to the Vikings and we're talking like after a year, like, oh, my God, Drake May was such a bust and McCarthy was such a great pick. I'm going to be like, not surprised because this is how the NFL works. And then that opinion could change within years if if, you know, the roster changes for both of those teams. As far as landing spot goes, though, like I. I've been told that Jaden Daniels is a good fit for Washington because Cliff Kingsbury is their coordinator, but I don't personally have anywhere close to as high a grade on Daniels as I do May, and I don't really see the ceiling. I, I guess there's the ceiling with Dan. Daniels just scares me in a lot of ways. As a, I, and this is not what I expected going into the process. I expected going into this process to have a clear top three with May, Daniels, and and Caleb. And I always knew Caleb was going to be way ahead of both of those guys because that's just how high I regard Caleb Williams. I love his film, and I think yep. – his projection is even better than the NFL. But I came away from the process completely different on Jaden Daniels. There's just way too many. We can get into it at some point, but there's just way too many red flags in his profile. And there's just not enough NFL throws that I see on his film. Like there's things that he does. There's the, again, it's the things that he and him and Penix do on tape that I'm just like, they look great. But like, when are they getting that opportunity at the NFL level? They're never finding that much space at the NFL level ever. And Daniels is a little bit better in that regard at using the middle of the field, in my opinion, than Penix. But both of them, as far as the NFL throws go, I don't, I don't know how many of them I see. So best fit for those quarterbacks at two and three, I would say, if you're Washington, it's Drake May because I just think he's the best prospect there. And if you're New England at three, like, and the and May is off the board, let's say, I, I do still think I would go with Jaden as the next quarterback, though, just from an upside standpoint. New England's a bad fit for any quarterback. Let's, but let's, let's talk about Jaden because there are red flags, like you said. Um, the middle of the, like, there are so many times, some of Jaden Daniels' be, plays that won him the Heisman, 70 yard run, 60 yard runs. When you go and watch it, you're like, oh, why didn't you throw Malik Neighbors, who's yes. literally throwing his hands up in the air wide open? Why didn't you, you know, all of these guys are dropping back in coverage. Your running back is wide open with no one within 12 yards. Why didn't you throw this? It's awesome that you turned it into a run, but why didn't you throw this? But I also don't want to, similar to McCarthy, I'm not going to blame him for the offense. Mission. Like, True. He threw to Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas on the slot phase because they they just worked. And I thought he did throw those balls really well. Yes. You know, his completion rate was like 60% on 20 plus yard throws. Nuts. You know, he like you, I, I've seen you talk about it. He does have some balls that flutter out on him. He doesn't have the best arm talent in the world. And that scrambling ability is going to be valuable. Is he going to be, have the same rushing yards? But like, it does it does buy him time to hope he figures it out. But I agree with you. When I watch him, I just I just like, man, this is what Justin Fields like the struggles are like this is what's stopping Justin Fields from being a good quarterback, despite the fact that Fields has better arm talent and is better equi equipped to run with his size. And that's why if you ask me, do I think Daniels ends up succeeding? I would say probably not. So I don't want to go too negative on it just yet. Bobby, I'll get into some of the negatives. Um because I actually one, one thing I would disagree with you on there is I actually like his arm talent better than Justin Fields arm talent, not the arm strength, obviously, just arm talent. And the reason I say that is just for me, he's a smooth and consistent thrower. And I mm. never felt like Justin Fields was a smooth and consistent thrower. I feel like the foot, the the feet, the feet, the footwork for Jane Daniels is great. Like I love watching his feet on tape and it's not a surprise to me. I read about this from Dane Brugler, but he was a former defensive back early in his life, like six years old, but his dad was a defensive back and he converted him to quarterback. And this dude's been working as a quarterback for a while. Since eight years old, he's had a quarterback trainer. And that, and I, and I feel to me like out of all these quarterbacks, him, 
Caleb Williams, who I think is very underrated in this regard, and J.J. McCarthy are the best at just staying connected and having smooth, consistent throwing motion and footwork and just a nice, quick release. So I actually mm. like his arm talent better than Fields, even though he does have deep balls that just, to me, die on the vertical plane. And you could see, like, I I, only, I didn't think this going in, but then you watch Neighbors for a film review you're going to do for the Giants podcast, for example, and you're like, damn, there's a lot of balls that seem to not get to the point I want them to get to on the vertical plane. And there's just times where these receivers are adjusting and slowing down where I'm just like, Okay, that's interesting from an arm talent standpoint. So I understand what you mean with Fields. He obviously has a better, like, stronger arm. I just personally like this type of thrower better, and I consider that to be better arm talent from that standpoint. And, like, I don't want to dis discount all the stats, too, right? 90 plays of 20-plus yards on his own in 2023. I don't, we, Me and Nick discussed this. I don't even think we have 90-plus plays of 20-plus yards in Daniel Jones' entire career with the Giants. I think that's very possible. The rushing and the throws of yeah. of and I'm and it's crazy to think about, but it might be true. He had 50 touchdowns on his own. You talked about it in the 20 plus throws, 67% completion, but also 22 to zero touchdown interception ratio. It's like when you go to the stats, it's unbelievable. The problem I have with that is like these are stats that like I, I just have a hard time translating what these players do at the college level to the NFL level being one as one to one as some people seem to think they are. But some there are other positives to his game in addition to like the clean, consistent throwing motion. He doesn't turn the ball over at the rate that some of these guys do. Over the last uh, two seasons, he has just 14 turnovers, seven fumbles, seven interceptions. Caleb Williams has 32 combined. Drake May, 26 combined. You know, Michael Penix, 25. So these guys are much higher on that range. And I think that there are like fits I can see for him at the NFL level, like teams that I think will maximize his skill set. So I think that's interesting. But overall, to me, like my comp for him is... Tyrod Taylor with a less explosive arm. That's mm. how I feel about him. Worse arm talent than Tyrod Taylor. I think that to me is very clear. Like worse when you arm talent than Tyrod Taylor? To me, yes. I think he has worse arm talent than Tyrod Taylor. No, because I, because, like, you know, one of the things that I, I Dan, I, I've, I've kind of picked up on this talking point that you've had. You already mentioned it once this, once this episode, but the thing that I love about Daniels the most is that he has such an easy throwing motion. Yes. And, you know, you talked about, you know, the, with McCarthy, how there's little wasted movement. And that's something that I, like I, my next quarterback, uh, I don't want, I want a big arm. I want an explosive arm and I want that ball to come out fast when you mm -hmm. make the decision. I also feel like that helps too. When you have defenders breathing down your neck, that ball's getting out faster. You're, hopefully you're not going to fumble as much and the throw is going to be more accurate. So that's the thing that I see with Daniels that it's like, I, from a standpoint of explosive plays, win football games, right? The NFL is a league of preventing big plays and producing them on yep. offense. And if you produce, and if you produce them at a top 10 rate, Odds are your winning percentage is like 65% year in and year out. Um, and Daniels does that. So that's like what I kind of really attract myself to. But also, you know, having those ultra talented wide receivers that could open, create space and space that, that may not be there in the NFL. That's what I go back and forth on on Daniels with. But just the the smoothness to his game. So I'm really surprised to hear that. So I like that. I think he has better arm talent than him in the short and intermediate range. From And okay. I think that's when you can see what you're talking about. But so my issues with, let me, let me try to try to uh, phrase, phrase this better. So for example, Tyrod Taylor, Last year, week 17, the 70 yard touchdown through throw he threw to to Darius Slayton. You rewatch that play, and that ball's in the air 56 yards from point yeah. A to point B. And it's not just a touch throw over the top, it has drive on it too. That I don't see on Jaden Daniels tape. And the thing that I have, all those plays you mentioned, like you win football games, those 20 plus yard throws. And I went over the stat, 22 touchdowns, zero interceptions, 67% completion rate, all these amazing stats at college level. And you'll see it with Penix too. The question I have is. If he's going to be that kind of explosive thrower at the NFL level, who's making those explosive throws, in my opinion, he has to see it so fast that he could get the ball out with touch and lead it into space. At the college level, there's so much space that he has to work with. So much. And these receivers are just destroying these defensive backs. So he has all this space to throw it into. And I don't always feel like he's throwing it with great anticipation. I just think there's such a large margin for error at the with what he was working with in his situation then. And I'm just concerned that that margin for error at the NFL is going to really, really shrink in shrink, I should say, on the vertical half. So I have concerns with that when you're not a drive thrower on the in the deep half. Oh, you know what's funny? Um, what week was the was the Tyrod throw? I think it was week 17, 17. against the Rams. That the one I'm, or, That's like the deepest throw in the NFL, like it, second deepest throw in the last like, yeah, five years. It was 62.1. And I kind of think that's the other thing. Like, I'm not, when I say he may have worse arm talent than Tyrod Taylor, or, or I didn't even say worse arm talent, a less explosive thrower is the way I would describe it. Yeah. Um, that's not even a knock on Jaden. I think to me, Tyrod's one of the most underrated quarterbacks in the NFL from what, I, from what I've seen. And I, I personally don't even think it was debated who was the 
like I know their situations were different, but the, the offense was to me a lot better with Tyrod last year than any other quarterback on the Giants. So it's not even a knock on Jaden. To me, it's more like I I like Tyrod's game. Who was number one in the NFL with the the longest oh, completed longest air throw? distance throw? Um, yeah. Was you it would Will never... Levis on that throw that he ripped back across the field? Uh, like you know, right, right team, wrong quarterback. You would never expect. Oh, this. it was Tannehill. <laughs> And his arm was cooked. <laughs> oh my god! I guess that was the throw that did it. That was the throw yeah, yeah, that, that ruined his arm. <laughs> ruined the arm. With Daniels, I, I think you have to lean into the legs to start, right? Mm-hmm. Because, like you said, there's some issue. There, there are those issues. Like the middle of the field is the main concern. I know the the deep arm talent, like that, that doesn't worry me as much because we just talked about. It. You're not really throwing the ball that far that often it's it's sure. usually going about between the 40 and 50 yard range and i think he can do that pretty damn well with with some pinpoint accuracy at times i but i do think that middle of the field stuff is where you worry where you if you're coaching him if you're the new england patriots and alex van pelt is their offensive coordinator who i don't i don't know how good of an oc he's gonna be you gotta lean in to like hey don't be afraid to use your legs which again he wasn't at lsu there was times where he used his legs where he shouldn't have you'd like him to see him throw the ball a little like keep his eyes up and throw the ball where he would keep his head down. But I, I think you have to lean on that. And while you try and develop, you know, some of the NFL quick yeah. game intermediate type of stuff. I think that's what also increases the floor too, is that you have, I mean, what's the Dan, do you know the most efficient play in football? The most efficient play in football. I don't know the answer when, to this. When a quarterback drops back to pass and then he it scrambles, tucks it, right? And he tucks it and runs. It's the yeah. most efficient play in football. I forgot that is the high. I actually did know that immediately because that was like basically what made Daniel Jones' ZPA so good in 22. Yeah, yeah, and not turning over the ball. So Yeah, maybe, that plus e- no turnovers. That's how you cheat EPA. Yeah, That's how you cheat the EPA. You're right. That is how you cheat the EPA. But I want to get into a few more just of the potential red flags I have with Jane Daniel and see what you guys think on this. So one thing that stands out to me is his big-time throw rate just took an insane jump with Brian Kelly in, that, in this past LSU season. Like He was in the 2% one year and under 2% another year before that and then dropped to eight point, uh, jumped to eight over 8% this past year. That scares me a little. And I think it could. He had a 14.1% scramble rate that ranks uh, among the 190 that breaks third among the 196 qualifying quarterbacks since 2019. Again, courtesy Nate Tice is such a good stat. The only other quarterback who that would be below is Malik Willis, and Caden Salter. Like those are the type of quarterbacks when he scrambles, Daniels, he, and you could see this on the tape too. When he scrambles, he's making his decision. And you talked about this earlier, Bobby, sometimes to, you know, when there's receivers breaking open the middle field, he's making a decision to run. He's not really looking up to throw the football. Another flag from a red flag for that standpoint um, would be just the fact that uh, since 2019, no quarterback has scrambled more times than Daniels, 258 career scrambles. Uh, or in its own stratosphere. The only other quarterback with over 200 was Dorian Thompson uh, Robinson from the Browns, it looks like, and he had 167, nearly 100 fewer scrambles than Daniels. My problem with that is, like, just going back to it, yes, the scramble is the most effective play, like you just went over, uh, Justin, in the NFL, but it's not, like, readily, it's not, you just can't do it the same way you can do it at the college level. The players right. are faster at the second level, and more importantly, it goes back to the thing we brought up earlier. If you're doing this at 100, I don't think he's going to get to 200 pounds, to be honest, looking at his frame. I know he quote unquote, like, I don't think he even test weighed in at the combine, actually. So I don't think we have a weight on him. But looking at his frame, and I know he played in the 180s, I'll say maybe 191. In fact, this is a contact sport, the NFL. Like, this is a combat sport. He takes sport. horrible hits. And he takes horrible hits, right? So now you're telling me this is a guy who scrambles over 100 times more than any college quarterback ever. He puts his head down and looks to scramble. And he's going to do it at the NFL level at 195 pounds, taking these horrible hits where he doesn't protect his body. And I will give him credit, Bobby. He did a better job later in the games, like the film I watched of him later in the year of protecting his body, but still not great. It's just hard for like that makes that's a major red flag to me. Like this, you have to st- like if your quarterback's injured in week five or week six, your whole season's ruined at that yeah. point. Yeah, for sure. But so, but yeah, with Jaden Daniels, I, I do like him though. Like I think if you put him, yeah. So this is where it's, this is where it's different than the conversation with JJ McCarthy because we're like, well, you just use you got to put him in the right system to make him work. But here's the thing: I think if you put Jaden Daniels in the right system, you're talking about like high, high level, high octane offense type of stuff, right? Yep. Like there's there's stuff that needs to grow, but you like you're going to be able to create those explosive plays. Um, with some of the other quarterback, we don't have to spend forever. Sure. I think Caleb Williams is going to take the Chicago Bears to the playoffs this year. Do you agree or disagree? 
That's a great, I love that take. I'm in on that. Give me that. There's seven playoff teams these days with the wild extra wild card. I'm in on that. I love Caleb Williams film. So I'm in on that. I, I think he's underrated, right? Cause me too. I've, I've said this line <laughs> over and over. So I'm ready for the draft to be done. So I could stop saying it. I think people watch the backyard football types of plays and they're like, that doesn't work. You can't play like that. When you go and watch it, like play for play, it was almost entirely out of necessity. I know. It was almost, it was, and when the stuff was clean and, and right, he hit it, right? Like, yep. you, I know you can pull a play here and there, but it's like, I actually think he operates that quick games type of stuff, NFL quick game, better than any other quarterback in the class. He just didn't really get the opportunity because his receivers didn't separate and his offensive line couldn't block for shit. And he was able to just do the back, like, the the versus Washington, the fourth down, where they where they go for it, and it's like, oh, this play got blown up, and he just peels back out, finds Brendan Rice, who I don't like at all, and and hits him for hits him for a touchdown, and it's like, like, like Brendan Rice is gonna get drafted two rounds higher than probably where he deserves to of be, be because of because of Caleb Williams, um, and then you saw when he had Jordan Addison, like they he won a Heisman, was put, put up all those numbers, so. I, I go back and watch that Notre Dame game and don't see, all oh, this quarterback crumbled. I, I see two really bad throws in a game yeah. where he was having to do anything. The ball that sailed over the tight end, I don't think that's going to happen very often. And then the when he's scrambling to his left, you know, f- trying to force a throw. But even when that, that throw, you see what happens. It's like, right. oh, okay, he sees that guy coming back to the ball, but a safety or corner or whatever, it's coming across the field and is able to pick it. Like, his mis- his every mistake he has is able to – for the most part, it's like, okay, we can talk through why this happened. It's reasonable. Yeah, I think you, the point you need, the reason I like Caleb so much, I mean, you could talk about all the things. There are other reasons. I, I personally find his and his arm down to be phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think his navigation of the pocket, his manipulation of the pocket is phenomenal. But the real reason I like him so much is the point you made. I think, and this is the biggest problem I have with like evaluating quarterbacks and what I hear from former quarterbacks and stuff. I think so many more, it's, it's not a problem. It's just the way I view it differently. A lot of people put a lot of the weight on evaluating their film at the college level. What did it look like that game? But like, I just don't know how much of that matters. I want to project what I'm actually going to see at the NFL level because how they do it in these against these Pac-12 defenses or whatever it might be is not that important to me because they're not getting a lot of these looks. But like demonstrating what you said, Bobby, the times he does have the ability to operate quick game, I think he's going to be the best quick game player in this entire class by far at quarterback because mm. he's super consistent uh, mechanics, both lower half to upper half, and his release is Aaron Rodgers' release. And that's just <laughs> going to give you unbelievable quick game. He puts the ball, he's going to get the ball out super fast every time and it's going to be on the spot and that to me makes him the best quick game projection in the nfl but people are going to look at the film and say and because he had so few opportunities and be like he's not the best quick game guy here's the best quick game guy and here's why look at the stats look at the film against this team i'm like yeah at the college level he might have been but i don't really care what he was at the college level i want to know about what he's going to be at the nfl level so that to me is the biggest reason i like caleb williams dan for that for that exact reason um you, you know i'm a stats guy this draft season, I'm out on stats for quarterbacks for college because we just don't yeah. we don't have we don't have enough data. I don't even know if there is the data that out there for NFL teams and, and all that and all that stuff. So we right. we just don't have it. Uh, is Caleb Williams the best QB prospect uh, since Andrew Luck? He is for me now. It's tough because like, <laughs> all right, this is this gets into the tough part. I like frame. Frame is a big thing for me with quarterbacks, and Trevor Lawrence had that frame. And that's a big reason I liked him so much as a prospect. He was polished too. He didn't have his like, so it's tough for me with Caleb versus Trevor because Caleb doesn't have the frame. My, my biggest two issues with Caleb Williams are I don't love his frame, though I do think he has the thicker build, which is good. It's not like the Bryce Young build. It's more like the Kyler Murray build, which is kind of like a thick lower half, which is good for taking the hits. I don't think it's gonna be a problem, but I would like him to be taller personally. I just prefer taller quarterbacks for seeing the middle of the field. And then the other issue for me with Caleb is the, is the fumbles. Those are, that's a real problem. I mean, like he has an insane amount of fumbles and we know Daniel Jones had an insane amount of fumbles at Duke and that carried over to the NFL. It's mm-hmm. not like the thing I can be guaranteed will fix. So Lawrence versus Williams is a tough one for me, but I go Caleb. Cause I just, what I look for in a quarterback, that arm talent, I just, and, and that release, I just think that release is so fast. And it, to me, it looks almost identical to Rogers, which is crazy to me. It's with crazy. Drake may, do you think, I really don't see this it could, a horrible situation can happen. I look at him as we like, haven't even talked to any Drake May yet, Bobby, which is I the know, quarterback we're most aligned on. I know. Me and you have probably DM'd <laughs> about him a, a handful of times. Um, 
I really think he's got it. Right, like the yeah. like the processing stuff. Like, I don't think it's as good as Caleb Williams, but man, it's really good. Like, in you know, getting different coverages thrown. You know, I did a fifteen minute video on him. Go check it out on the Talking Giants channel, um, listeners. And there's like, okay, let's just look at some big time throws at the vertical on the verticals on the sideline that don't take a ton of reading, but you you got to be able to make the throws. Bam, got it. Now let's look at creation the way that Josh, Josh Allen does. Bam, got it. Now let's look at processing, looking at different coverages, spin, you know, a safety spinning late, all this type of stuff. And he does it and he gets it with a great placement and great timing that, yes, does he have these randomly weird and accurate throws? Absolutely. Yes. But I see so much many great throws that I can live with a bad throw to as long as they're not turning into consistent turnovers. Right. And I don't think you can just say, oh, well, he's going to fix that the way other quarterbacks like. Josh Allen and Lamar have fixed, which again, those guys still do have. They still turn it these over. Ran, these random inaccuracy blips, right? But they just make so many great plays that you're able to. You don't. You don't remember them, right? You you for, you forget them. Um, that were, you know, like even like little stuff, like sliding away from the protect, you know, from from the pressure and and buying that extra second and a half to make those throws that. I think it would have to take a pretty bad coaching job and talent wise to make this where this guy is just a failure as a quarterback. Yeah, I'm with you on obviously, you know, this Bobby and Justin, I'm sure you've seen this just from my Twitter. I'm a massive fan of Drake May's game. I think for, for some of the reasons you've discussed. And I think the main thing here is like, this harpens back to something I discussed with Nick, like five minutes before we jumped in this. And then Sean McAvoy, a quarterback trainer and coach, you watch these guys on film Penix. You watch them all together, Drake May, Caleb, and Drake May has like 35 NFL throws a year. And those other guys have maybe three, four, five you find on tape, if you're lucky, that are actual NFL throws where you need anticipation. That's the thing. Mm. I don't understand why people discuss Drake May as this poor processor, Bobby. This is the thing I don't understand. Me and Nick are both just confused by this because we've read a bunch of scouting reports from other people who think he's a bad processor. I feel like he's the only one throwing with anticipation at the end, like NFL level caliber anticipation and processing besides besides moments from Penix, and then obviously you have it with Caleb Williams. Like some of the big time throws that he makes over the middle, you discussed earlier with McCarthy, you were saying you were you were concerned more about like the anticipation and the willingness to throw it on the 20 plus. I feel like there's a difference between the type of big time middle of the field throws that May makes and the ones McCarthy makes because May has the ability to change the trajectory on the football and put it in different spots. McCarthy is going to be a line drive dart. And I feel like it's more of the short intermediate May is hitting like the, the vertical and the intermediate vertical areas of the field with throws that you just don't see from an anticipation. The ball is out before the receiver is making his break. And then as the receiver, Nick just says that's best. Like as the receivers turning and putting his hands to the ball, the ball's there. That's just not happening a lot for a lot of these other quarterbacks. And again, I feel like it's happening 30 to 35 times a year between 2022 and 2023 film of May versus, you know, the 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 few, fewer for these other quarterbacks. And then the other factor is like the willingness to even try those throws. Like you have to have confidence in your arm talent and the timing and everything. And I feel like you said you see some hesitancy with McCarthy. I see that too. I see it with pretty much the entire class outside of Drake May and Caleb Williams and Spencer Rattler for what it's worth, though I have other reservations about Rattler, but I do like his arm talent and his willingness to make those anticipatory throws. Um, so I agree with that. Now it comes to the other things, like the negatives that you brought up with Drake May. This is where like I... So I think he has the it factor, and I don't think that can be quantifiable. So I don't. I agree with you. There's not as much a bust profile as people th as may think, but I do think there is something. Can I to say discuss. something though? Yeah, yeah. The it factor is real, I mm. but so. I, I also hate the it factor. <laughs> okay. Um, because people who don't know what they're talking about will just say he just doesn't have the it factor. And yeah. It drives me nuts. I'm like, look at all of this that I showed you on this player, and you're just saying yes. doesn't have it, and it drives me nuts. But I do, <laughs> I do agree that it's a real thing, though. And I think for like to try to quantify it, it's part of what we just said, like the confidence to throw those tight windows and to rip it, the ability outside of structure, and like the, those are those. It's not just like do you win these games in the big moments? Like it's not like that type of <laughs> dog thing. levels, dog levels, but. As far as the stuff that's concerning with him, I thought this was really interesting. So John McAvoy came on and he said from his evaluation, part of the reason the footwork is so wonky is the changeover from Phil Longo's system to, I forgot the guy who came over from Auburn, who was his coordinator last year. It was 
generally speaking, like you look at the tape from 2022 to 2023, it's night and day. He's just, the system is that the route combinations are horrible. The system is not good. Like you're going from a great offense coordinator to a bad one with May's tape. But what he said was Phil Longo teaches a certain style of drop back, which is, uh, I think it's like a, it's a way to help you throw to your left. It's like a drift right style. And it's a comp, it's a compensation instead of, and you could see it on his film, the difference in the footwork from May from 2022 to 2023. And I feel like a lot of the reasons he's missing on these throws is just, he doesn't have confidence yet in what he wants to do from a footwork standpoint. And also I've who, seen, I've seen on a couple scouting reports too, that May's a drifter, that he drifts in the pocket. Yeah. So I, you know, Hey, if you wonder, I think if there's times, but I think a lot of times he's drifting away from the pressure. Like there's, right. they're, yeah. they're loading up the blitz on one side and he's drifting away from that pressure. But that's partially from what they taught from what Phil Lingo, Longo teaches, according to McAvoy, which is really interesting. I never heard of that at all. So it's partially to compensate for that. But you know, what I think about when I hear that guys is like, Okay, yeah, he's not that confident yet in his mechanics and his footwork, but guess who else wasn't? Josh Allen, like, at Wyoming was not confident. Justin Herbert, people forget how bad Justin Herbert's last year film at times, how bad. I, I yeah. used bad. I didn't think it was bad. How bad, because I'm looking at projections, but how bad people, quote-unquote, quote were quote, claiming that film to be from a footwork and mechanic standpoint. But those are things you can actually fix and work on at the NFL level with the right coaching. Like, I don't have to worry as much about that. Like, might. Yeah, there's going to still be Sam Darnold cases, right? Like people who had bad footwork to begin with and it never improved at the NFL level. It's not a guarantee. I'm not saying May is guaranteed to clean up this stuff, but it's a lot easier to clean up that than the arm talent, which is not possible to clean up or the confidence and the to make those big time throws and to throw the anticipation, have the confidence in the balls to do it like we see with him. So I just don't worry as much about this stuff. I just kind of hope the right coach can fix that or a good coach can fix that. Yeah. I actually got a message that kind of confirmed what you said, you know, um, from a North Carolina guy who listens to talking okay. giants and said, just listen to the QB episode. And one thing I wanted, I would point out with Drake and his footwork is that he had two offensive coordinators and Phil Longo had him doing a completely different type of drop than what he did last year. That in his junior or senior high school was canceled during the COVID, but everything else was spot on. Even his amazing games, he normally had one or two throws where he just flat out missed, and it was the weirdest thing. So yeah, yeah. like basically confirming everything you said about the the new offensive coordinator, Phil Longo. So yeah, I, I think he's going to be special. Um, I selfishly hope he goes to the Giants. Me too. Um, I, I selfishly also. I think it's crazy self- if he goes anywhere but to, huh? I was going to say, this is how selfish I am with it. I selfishly don't want him to go to the Patriots either. I just don't want him stuck in that situation. But I want it cool to be to the Giants, but it's not the Giants. I don't, but I also don't want it to be Washington either. So like, I'd rather prefer, if it's not the Giants, I want it to be like a Minnesota Vikings straight up. Personally. No, I don't want it because <laughs> then I would, I would, might hurt myself. I'll just be mad that we didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's my, that's, that's my worst case scenario for drafting okay. as a Giants fan is not drafting JJ McCarthy. It's that we, if we had the opportunity to draft up for Drake May. And and we did it. You were close to dropping that K word. I, I saw I saw the mouth. I was like, don't say it. Don't do it. <laughs> if if that happened, there's two Drake May scenarios where I'll never mind. Um, I was going to say, if Dude, if that happens, I, I, I might use the gun. If, if we're able to trade up for Drake May, I'm going to be shooting rounds in the air in celebration in the John Boy media office. That, that Wonderful. I like. um, Wonderful. I actually fantasized about like, the Giants select Drake, Drake May, and I'm just like over the moon. I, I've had those fantasies as well. Okay. Bo Nix or Michael Penix? Not a huge fan of either, but it would be Michael Penix for me. Okay. What 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 do you think is the deciding factor in that? The deciding factor in that for me is that I like Michael Penix's arm talent a lot more than Bo Nix. And I have a crutch. I do lean too much on arm talent in my evaluation of quarterbacks. I personally believe there's no real ceiling for a quarterback without – basically elite level arm talent, but I'll even take just above average arm talent. Like a Kirk Cousins is a good example of that he does never had elite arm talent, but he is such a good processor that he's been able to become a really good quarterback. The same thing I feel like is the, and he wasn't the same player the first 10 years right. of his career that he has, that he was the last few. Exactly. That's another thing. So I'll say above average arm talent. So Michael Penix has the level of arm talent. I want Bo Nix. I'm not so sure he has that. Yeah. I, I would agree that Penix has better arm talent than, um, than Bo Nix. I, I prefer Nix. With Penix, my biggest issue is it's a strength and an issue is that it's very much like one, two, three, let's get the ball out. But there's a lot yeah. of times where it's like, hey, man, there's more to be had on this play, but you're just throwing the ball out because you want to get it on time. You want to make sure you don't get a sack. There's no creation. With Nix, I actually I kind of like Bo Nix's film, but like you said, I don't like his arm talent. And 
the fact that okay, yeah, you've kind of you've mastered this offense, but it's not yes. really an NFL offense, and you've had five years of college football to to get better at your craft. But I do I see like a good same amount can of be said about Penix though, right? There's even <laughs> yeah yeah I agree, and there's there's some craziness. There's some like highlight plays that Bo Nix ha- has agreed. But I just I agree. I don't like his arm talent, especially when we got to see it in person and mobile and at the senior bowl or just yeah. like this is this is not impressive. Didn't and when he was he, did, he just didn't look good in that environment in general. Um I know his stats versus pressure are like the best in the class, but I yeah, see his system. feet get super unsettled. Yeah. I see the ball come out a little, you know, you know, kind of short hop when he's got pressure, but he was in a nice system. But he, and he, he can, made and he that can, system a little I mean, better, like, too. Let me say this. He did make that system a little better, and I actually like his tape more than I expected. Like, I feel like he had some off-platform throws that were nice. Like, not again, though, but that's the difference. Like, they were nice at the college level. My, right. You guys know this. Justin, you've been to a million games. I have, too. I grew up. I haven't been able to go lately because of work. And, Bob, you've been to a few. MetLife Stadium in, in, in whatever, East Rutherford, in – December and January, like you need to have a certain level of arm talent to throw in that stadium consistently. Yeah. And it's, if you don't have that, it doesn't matter how what else you can do out there. In my opinion, you're just never going to get over the barometer you need to to, to have success. Yeah. Do you think and, he can have success with Sean Payton in Denver? Uh, Bo Nix, you're asking. Yeah. What What do you? Well, that's a good question too. This is an even more thirty thousand foot field question. What do you consider success? What is success considered to you? I should say. People not wanting Sean Payton fired for the next two years. <laughs> I think so. Then I think Sean Payton can coax out. A, I think Sean Payton's a great quarterback coach. So I think like whatever happened with Russell Wilson last year was more on Russ than Sean in my mind at least. Even then, his stats look a lot better than what his fun, play was. Right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like he can get stats out of Bo Nix, I think. But then again, I think about it also, and I think sometimes these quarterbacks come to the NFL with that level of arm talent and just have no solutions. Like I've seen these quarterbacks get into their final first NFL start, and they're completely overwhelmed by the pressure, the speed of the game, and everything like that. Last guy I want to, at least that I want to talk about, you mentioned him a little earlier. And while everybody's debating Knicks and Penix, Penix should be higher. McCarthy should be higher. And obviously there's the big three. Spencer Rattler's kind of just there. Now, I last time that I really checked in on Spencer Rattler, he seemed to be a little bit of a, you know, attitude issues kind of off the field and head right. case. So, you know, hey, we, we could be calm. He could have calmed down this past year at South Carolina. And he also could be calm it down for the, NFL process and kind of off the field stuff. Are you willing to work hard? I feel like that stuff is more important than even your arm talent and your talent and your ceiling, right? Are you willing to get better as a quarterback? How do you deal with adversity? But talk to me about Spencer Rattler. You mentioned him shortly and briefly. And even I'm like, I'm even starting to get curious poking around saying like, Hey, would a Sean Payton even like a guy like that? Yeah. Spencer Rattler for me, I'm no, I want to quantify it. I'm not like huge on Spencer Rattler, but if I was going to make a bet after those first four quarterbacks and even JJ is borderline for me, but it would be Rattler over Penix and over Knicks because Rattler to me has clearly better arm talent than Knicks. And as far as Penix goes, I, I don't know. It's hard to explain, but I kind of feel like Penix's arm talent is a little bit overrated for what the NFL, for the NFL level. And I'll just say it from this standpoint. Like, I see more NFL anticipatory throws from Spencer Rattler when I watch him than I do from Penix. His film is solid, and he dealt with pressure, pressure, pressure. And he had the Daniel Jones talked about him. What'd you say? I said, me and Nick Villardo talked about him, and it's like, man, he had to deal with a lot of shit up front, and he was able to handle it. You had some big time throws. Now, you had mistakes within that pressure, but. And and I think he's actually has matured from like the Oklahoma yes. days where he was kind of just a shithead. He has. And he got uh, humbled, yeah. honestly. He got humbled. He really did. I've heard some interviews. I think he's past that point. And it doesn't mean he's going to be what Justin said, though. And I agree with you, Justin. That's more important than Armtown processing anything. We Nick and I always say that's the foundation. Will you be the Daniel Jones first person in, first person out? It, you need to have it. It's a baseline. Unfortunately, it doesn't guarantee you anything. And it's just right. a baseline. That's literally all it gets you. But but you need to have it. But as far as Rattler goes, he had the Daniel the equivalent of the Daniel Jones 2023 situation last year. He was pressured on over 40% of his dropbacks and even worse. Worse, he had a different offensive line combination in 10 out of 12 games last year. Mm. So that's literally what Jones had. That's the NFL. <laughs> the things I like about him are his arm talent, his anticipatory throws, the more NFL throws. The things that I have concern with with Rattler, for me at least, is his frame and his athleticism. I see too many – too like I think somebody term, the, the compared this best. In the pocket, athleticism-wise – He's remind he reminds them of Baker Mayfield and Baker Mayfield ends up taking so many more sacks than he needs to because he simply doesn't have the athleticism to get out of those situations uh, and to escape in a lot of situations. So I worry about that plus his frame at the NFL yeah. level. He's only but, six foot and he's two eleven. Yes, 
and not and did you see him run the did you see him run the 40 yeah it's a four four nine five but you got to see him actually run it. It did not look pretty out there. And he just doesn't. And it's not even that. To me, it's more just like the agility, the functional athleticism. I just don't see it when I watch him on tape. I feel like he doesn't do a good job of getting himself out of tough spots in the pocket. Much. He looks situation. like he added uh, your little your little McCarthy theory that he added weight for the combine. Yeah. Like it, it looks like. It kind of looks like Spencer Rattler also had a little weight they for the combine. Do. They're too. all just yeah. putting on Spencer paper. Rattler looks kind of like a, a a little thick dude. He's short. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I think Rattler's going to be a good backup okay. um, in, in the league. Um, what do you think about Michael Pratt's throws between fit? Oh. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> just going to see. I, I am going to watch. I'm going to tell Pratt, you I haven't watched any Michael Pratt. So I'm going to watch gonna him the day honest. like on my flight to New York City for the draft. I have no interest in watching. Oh, here's Pratt. another thing: Can we bring the damn bra- draft back to New York City? I know. It was awesome. Uh, the, I so when I was doing write ups and stuff, I just threw on like the 04 and 05 draft in the background. Yeah. It was just a better. It was so cool. It was a better environment. It was a better broadcast. Yep. It was. It was. I I, I miss those days. Be, yeah. People had more like. You had Chris Mortensen not being like, I think they no. He's like, nope. This guy is this the guy on this board. They they knew right. shit. They didn't dance around it. Yep. Um, they they just pin pit on a damn good product in the early two thousands. They did. Um, and and they weren't afraid to like criticize picks. They now they never. That's the that. worst thing about draft analysis yeah. right now because it's because of people like us, right? Because it's right. become so like you don't Mainstream. have to go up through the corporate ladder and all that stuff. You can just start posting stuff on Twitter. Right. Because I do think a lot of people are afraid to be ki- critical of draft prospects because it's it's just you get blowback if for that type of stuff. Um, yeah. And, I, I, and, and then especially when it's on TV, right? Like you see a lot of people on TV just turn into like everybody, everything's the best thing ever yes. type of stuff because TV that's that's what's going to get yeah. the get going to get the love. So, yep. Completely agree with you on that. Um, all right, so that's an episode of football today. Dan Schneier at Dan Schneier NFL. Um, you could check out his work on Nickelodeon as well. No, oh, no, <laughs> oh, not, not now. It's even worse <laughs> than ever to bring that up. Worse than ever, man. It's even worse than ever. It's a disaster. Dan Snyder, the former Washington owner, or this dude, it's actually somehow yeah. worse. Which would you, which I guess <laughs> easily the Redskins, owner, the, the Washington <laughs> Commanders owner, easily. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Neither, but easily. Which, which that do you guy. which do you prefer to be misidentified with? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which scumbag do you want? <laughs> Unfortunately, the spelling of your name is more like the Nickelodeon. I one. know it's horrible, dude. It's so bad. So um, bad. go check him out on CBS Sports. <laughs> check out his Big Blue Banter podcast. Um, appreciate you, um, Justin. Anything else before we we drop out of here? No, that's it. Here you go. That's the. Sorry, I, I'm Chris Rose. To... I didn't honor your wishes, but I just couldn't do it. <laughs> trying to we think of the title of this it. episode. The most uh, in-depth quarterback prospect. Con- That's what I think this was. This was a this, really which in-depth. QBs will f- which QBs will fail and or su- succeed or fail? How about That's that? That's a good one. Okay, I think we're going with that. How about there that? You go. I'd appreciate you guys. We'll see you um, on Tuesday. We're back with Chris Rose most likely. Thank you again, Dan Schneider. Go check him out. Go follow him. And we will see you next week.